All right, thanks for sticking around. Um, my name's Matt McDowell. As Professor Atwater mentioned, I just finished up a postdoc at Caltech where I worked on these protection layers for enabling integrated solar fuels devices. And I recently started a professor position at Georgia Tech. So um, this area in which we've developed these protection layers has been really exciting in JCAP. We've been working on it for about three years now. Uh, it's an interesting area in terms of scientific avenues, and it's also enabled the use of high performance, moderate band gap semiconductors like silicon and gallium arsenide in integrated devices. So um, as many of you know, and as studied long ago by Garisher and others, um, many semiconductors are unstable under illumination in aqueous environments. And so this poses a, a significant challenge to integrated solar fuels devices. And in particular, photoanodes are especially susceptible. Um, Photoanodes are where the, the oxidation happen, uh, or the oxidation reaction happens occur, or where that occurs. Um, so for a um, water splitting system, that's where water oxidation occurs. And in CO2 reduction, we're also interested in doing water oxidation at the photoanode. Um, so photoanodes are more susceptible because they have extra photogenerated holes hanging out in the material in your semiconductor. And so they, uh, these holes can go towards corroding your semiconductor rather than um, the oxidation, happen that you, uh, oxidation reaction that you want to occur. So this plot here is just an example of what a uh, photo corrosion process looks like in a certain material. This is bismuth vanadate, which is a commonly studied um, semiconductor oxide. You can see here that the photo current over about 15 minutes decays pretty dramatically. But if you look at what's actually happening in terms of physical um, performance, so this is a, a TEM image of a bismuth vanadate film on an FTO substrate. And you can see here, before the test, you have a very thin, conformal bismuth vanadate film. After an hour of testing in pH 13 conditions, you can see that the film is partially dissolved. So bismuth vanadate, um, the, uh, the photo corrosion in bismuth vanadate is manifest by this dissolution process. This is uh, in contrast to other materials which actually um, passivate when they photo corrode. Um, so Moving on from bismuth vanadate towards technologically important semiconductors like silicon, gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide, and others, um, these, these materials require protection schemes because they're naturally um, very prone to photo corrosion. And so um, this seems like a pretty simple idea. Coat something on top of your semiconductor to protect it from corrosion. Uh, but it's actually uh, fairly complicated. And that's one of the reasons why it hasn't been successfully done in the last 30 or 40 years. So there's a number of different requirements for photoelectrochemical protection layers. These include, of course, that it has to be resistant to corrosion. It also has to be transparent to allow photons to travel through the film to the underlying semiconductor. And it also has to be conductive to photogenerated carriers. And so this last point is of particular importance. Um, so there's been uh, quite a bit of successful work uh, in recent years focused on ultra-thin protective layers. Um, and these have been applied with techniques like atomic layer deposition. This is some data from um, an example that came out of Stanford a few years ago where ultra-thin TiO2 uh, on the order of a few nanometers thick was used to protect silicon photoanodes. And you can see here that the stability uh, in this voltage versus time plot was improved from less than an hour to about eight hours. I've also worked in this area um, coating bismuth vanadate polycrystalline materials with ultra-thin TiO2 films to enhance um, the lifetime. Uh, but overall, these ultra-thin films are useful, uh, but it's very difficult uh, and probably impossible to actually create an ultra-thin film with indefinite stability just because of natural pinholes and other defects. Basically, you always run into photo corrosion problems um, after 5 to 20 hours, something like that. And so moving to thicker protection layers is a necessary uh, motion. So this is where um, some of the work that JCAP has come in, as well as other work around the country and also around the, uh, around the world. Um, but I'll specifically focus on what, what we've done in the last two or three years. So um, we focused on titanium oxide, titanium dioxide, as a photoanode protection layer. And the first study that, uh, that was published here from JCAP was focused on uh, uh, thicker TiO2 films, about 100 nanometers thick, in conjunction with a nickel, um, a nickel metal overlayer, as you can see in this schematic here. These were deposited on N-type semiconductors, like um, N-silicon, which are the photoactive semiconducting um, materials for the device. 
You can see if you take this, this tri-layer stack here and insert it into one molar KOH electrolyte in a photoelectrochemical cell and test its photoelectrochemical properties, you see that these rectifying um, curves indicating um, water oxidation, uh, solar-driven water oxidation. And the interesting thing to note in this plot, these CVs, is that for all these different, well, you can't really see there, but there's uh, thicknesses of TiO2 ranging from 4 to 150 nanometers, and they all basically line up on each other. So the TiO2 here is very conductive to these photogenerated holes that are arising from the silicon. Um, in addition, there, these TiO2 layers imparted great stability to these photoelectrodes. This, uh, this plot here shows over 100 hours stability with about 10 to 15 percent decay in photocurrent um, in pH 14 conditions. So this was uh, quite exciting at the time. Um, in addition to silicon, uh, this TiO2 material has been deposited on other n-type semiconductors and has been shown to be protective uh, and also forming um, um, rectifying heterojunctions. So here is a plot showing gallium phosphide as well as gallium arsenide materials, two different curves there, and also cadmium telluride, n-type cadmium telluride has been used in conjunction with these TiO2 nickel layers, uh, all showing good rectifying properties. Uh, and these are the photocurrent stability plots uh, that accommodate those cyclical tamograms. And so in these cases, the TiO2 layers are all 100 nanometers thick and, and greatly enhance the stability of all these materials. So uh, a really interesting aspect of using atomic layer deposition um, to, uh, for the deposition of these protective layers is that we can move away from simple um, um, flat substrates, um, as in many semiconductor manufacturing, um, and we can actually move towards microwire-based electrodes. As many of you probably know, microwires are a linchpin of JCAPs, um, so some of JCAPs integrated devices, um, because they allow for different types of devices to be made um, that could be very useful um, for water splitting or CO2 reduction. So atomic layer deposition has been used to, to coat a, a silicon microwire array very conformally. If you look at the cross section of a single microwire here in the bottom left, you can see just at the surface there's a, a lighter area which is the TiO2 film with an invisible on this scale um, nickel layer at the surface. And uh, these microwire electrodes basically showed good performance in terms of cyclic voltammetry, and, and very excitingly, they also showed um, a, a, very, a, a rather dramatic increase in the stability um, when the photocurrent stability was tested over 1,500 hours, as you can see in the bottom right there. And so, actually, these microwires are quite a bit more stable when protected than a planar substrate. And, and we think this is because, basically, the, um, the structured array uh, allows for each microwire itself to be acting as an individual electrode, in a sense. And if there are defects or pinholes in, in the um, protective film, um, a single microwire might be damaged. Uh, the electronic properties of a single microwire might be damaged, but the rest of the microwires are still there and can behave um, uh, with good performance. So um, structuring a substrate in this way uh, has, has benefits for um, long-term stability. So just a little bit uh, about the structure and electronic properties of this, these TiO2 materials. There's been a lot of work um, that's been done in JCAP because of the exciting performance that was generated uh, towards understanding how these materials are working. So this is a cross-sectional TEM image of the um, atomic layer deposition deposited um, TiO2 material. And as you can see, it's amorphous there, shown by the electron diffraction pattern. If you zoom in um, on the silicon titanium oxide interface, you can see uh, that the uh, silicon, of course, is crystal and the TiO2 is amorphous. There's uh, a silicon oxide interlayer right at the interface that's um, inevitable. Uh, it's always there based on how we make these films. Um, XPS shows that uh, the, the TiO2 um, has a primary Ti4 plus component um, and there's a, a, a very small amount of Ti3 plus. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, um, this amorphous ALD deposited TiO2 shows a very high concentration of defect states within the band gap. And you can't really see this with, uh, on this plot in the bottom right, but um, this is a valence band XPS spectrum showing a small bump there, which gets larger if you zoom in, obviously, um, uh, that indicates that there are defect states, electronic defect states within the band gap of this material. Um, so there's been uh, uh, work towards understanding the conduction mechanisms in these TiO2 films. Um, this is a, a schematic band diagram. I hope you can see what's going on there. But basically on the left you have the, the silicon, the conduction band and valence band of the silicon. Uh, and then in the middle there's the TiO2 material which has a larger band gap. And so the initially surprising thing about these findings was that um, we were seeing that these photogenerated holes from the silicon valence band right here uh, were, you know, were moving through the TiO2. 
we were surprised because there's this large valence band on offset. And so you wouldn't expect the photogenerated holes to move from the silicon valence band to the TIA2 valence band into the nickel and then into the solution. Um, so there's a few different options for what may be happening. One is that these mid-gap defect states, which we know exist, are acting as um, charge transport carriers through the film itself. There is also an option of um, uh, basically a conduction band type transport mechanism where the, um, the photogenerated holes in silicon move through the TiO2 conduction band. Um, and this is actually a, an area of ongoing study within JCAP. Uh, I'll just quickly mention that there's been some really interesting in operando studies done at uh, the uh, Advanced Light Source at LBNL um, to examine uh, the electronic properties of these materials actually when they're in contact with a liquid electrolyte um, uh, using XPS. So this is a, kind of a new area of study and uh, Professor Atwater mentioned this also in terms of in operando studies um, which has revealed some really interesting things which I don't have time to talk about now um, but and will surely be used in the future for uh, uh, greater understanding of these systems. Uh, and I'll just also briefly mention that we, we've um, done some studies on varying the crystal structure of these TiO2 films and understanding how that influences conductivity and also heterojunction formation uh, in, in contact with silicon. So oh, here you see three different types of TiO2 films. There's an amorphous film uh, on the upper left. There's an anatase film, which is a different crystal structure in the top here. And then uh, on the right, there's actually a mixed anatase rutile film, which is sputtered. Uh, it turns out that all these films behave well. Um, they actually form rectifying contacts with n-type silicon and are quite conductive to photogenerated carriers, uh, indicating that perhaps the, the um, charge transport mechanism in the system is more general um, than previously thought. Um, so I'll move on from TiO2 now. Uh, TiO2 has been very successful in terms of enabling these semiconductors, but uh, recent work has actually focused on a different material, nickel oxide. So nickel oxide is, uh, there's a number of reasons why you might want to use nickel oxide as a protection layer for semiconductor materials. Uh, the first is that it is transparent, has a rather large band gap. Uh, it's stable in alkaline environments like TiO2, but it's actually P-type as opposed to TiO2, which is N-type. And the P-type nature should naturally allow it to conduct holes um, from the silicon valence band. And finally, it is catalytic for the oxygen evolution reaction, which is the reaction that we're doing with these photoanodes. And so all these, uh, the combination of all these factors uh, make it an attractive material for study. So this was, uh, nickel oxide films were synthesized by a, a colleague postdoc of mine, Kay Sun at Caltech. Uh, this is an TEM image, or a, a scanning TEM image of what the films look like. Uh, they're columnar, as you can see. And then these are uh, cyclical tamograms under illumination showing rect rectifying properties in contact with N-silicon. Uh, but very excitingly, these films show, show um, significant stability in pH 14 conditions. Uh, you can see here that um, this is a test uh, of a silicon protected with nickel oxide over 1,200 hours with uh, very little photocurrent um, decay over that amount of time. And I think, uh, maybe somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think these have been extended to over 2,000 hours now with very little um, decay in the photocurrent. So these nickel oxide films uh, in alkaline conditions seem to be um, working very well protecting in these um, semiconductors. And these are cyclical tamograms during this um, uh, photocurrent stability test. Uh, I'll also quickly mention that uh, uh, if you do it right, if you make a film that's the right thickness, they can also be anti-reflective. And so uh, optimizing all the properties, including the catalytic activity, anti-reflectivity, uh, and then the stability enhancement are, is an important aspect of designing these materials. Uh, in addition to silicon, these nickel oxide films have also uh, been used to protect n-type cadmium telluride and also amorphous silicon thin films um, with, uh, with good results. And these are the cyclical tamograms um, for these different samples. Um, I'll just make one note about these nickel oxide films. They work very well for stabilizing um, semiconductors that passivate naturally. So these are semiconductors like silicon that form a passivating oxide. Um, if you were to try to use these nickel oxide films that we have grown to stabilize um, semiconductors that, that um, dissolve when they corrode, like gallium arsenide, actually we haven't had good, good luck with that. Uh, uh, very little um, to, to report there. And this is just because uh, naturally these um, dissolution materials are, are harder to um, uh, uh, protect, especially when you have pinholes in a film. And so this is actually an area of, of future important um, um, uh, emphasis, I think, within the community. 
Okay, I'll, I'll just finish up here with uh, an example of a, a slightly different material. This is uh, nickel cobalt oxide, which is related to nickel oxide, is also a p-type material. Uh, this is work actually from LBNL, um, the LBNL arm of JCAP, uh, where nickel cobalt oxide was shown to be a very good p-type protection layer also. So just kind of expanding our library of uh, um, pr these protection layers. Uh, it produced very large photovoltages actually in contact with, um, with silicon. And uh, uh, um, cobalt oxide has also been examined, so this is a, a paper in which uh, a very thin cobalt oxide layer, a few, just a few nanometers thick, was coated on an NP silicon homojunction, which is the light absorbing material. And um, uh, this, was, uh, this came out last year, but what, what was found was that these, this cobalt oxide basically passivates some of the surface defect states. Um, uh, within uh, on the silicon and can thus lead to a lower recombination and very high photovoltages around 600 millivolts. Um, and so uh, this cobalt oxide has been a tool that we've been using recently actually to improve the photovoltages of, of standard header junctions that are produced at very low temperature under moderate um, conditions. And so this is an example of that where we have we're using uh, a silicon protected by nickel oxide as I mentioned before but instead of, uh, instead of, instead of putting the nickel oxide directly on silicon, we're actually um, creating a cobalt oxide interlayer, just a few nanometers thick. You can't really see it in this image, but um, it's there, as, as shown by the EDS spectrum on the right. And the cobalt oxide actually changes the electronic properties significantly and improves the photovoltage of this um, heterojunction by about 200 millivolts. So this is just an example and something that we're thinking a lot about now uh, in terms of um, improving the properties of these heterojunctions uh, while avoiding the use of, of um, homojunction silicon and um, um, solar cells or other, or other types of homojunctions. So that's a, a nice area of improvement there. And then to finish up, uh, I've talked a lot about you know, the development of these materials, which materials we've been using. Um, a, an important aspect of this is that these protection layers have enabled um, the, uh, the creation and fabrication of integrated devices with high efficiency. So this is an SEM image showing a, a dual junction absorber protected by a TiO2 protection layer. Um, this is a, um, actually a, a gallium arsenide, indium gallium phosphide multi-junction cell. And you can see, or maybe you can see, but on the right there, we have a titanium oxide protection layer on the surface of this photoelectrode um, that produces a very high voltage. And in a two-electrode configuration with a nickel molybdenum counter-electrode where the hydrogen evolution is happening, um, we were able to demonstrate over 10% solar hydrogen efficiency for 40 hours, which is, at the time, I think a record, um, I think. Uh, so that was very exciting, and that was enabled by this, this fundamental science that, was, that went into understanding these protection layers and development of these protection layers. Uh, so just to conclude here, so a lot of work at JCAP and a lot of time of graduate students and postdocs and staff scientists has been devoted to developing these protection layers. Um, they've shown very good performance um, in protecting photoanodes for water oxidation. They've enabled unprecedented stability, um, and they've been shown to, f to form high voltage heterojunctions when in combination with various semiconductors. Uh, and they can also protect materials that have different form factors, which is quite important for the creation of integrated solar fuels devices. So to conclude, uh, these are the acknowledgments. A lot of these people on the left are the students and postdocs and other staff that did much of the work. And on the right are the PI um, type people um, that led the work. So thanks very much for your attention, and I'll take any questions if we have any time. Question for you right here, man. Yeah. Matt, what's a typical area of your devices and how scalable is the LED if you were to code meter squared? Yeah, so the typical area of, of the single electrodes that we make is less than a centimeter squared in between 0.1 and 0.3 centimeters squared. Um, the area of the demonstrated device, I think, was probably around there, maybe a little higher. Um, we've gone up within JCAP to a few centimeters squared, is that right? Um, uh, encoding ALD. Anything up to, for ALD in particular, anything up to um, uh, you know, wafer scale is not that difficult, but going to meters squared, I, you know, I'm not actually qualified to answer that question. Um, I'm sure there's people maybe in the audience that know about ALD type manufacturing on larger scales like that, but I do see that being uh, a challenge probably. Question. Yeah, uh, these protection layers, have you looked at their stability in the dark over extended periods of time? Um, 
after all, these devices are going to spend half a lifetime in the dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so the the main the main um, testing protocol that we use is a, a photocurrent stability test. But there has been a lot of discussion and probably some experiments related to uh, cycling um, light and dark uh, for the protection layers. I'm not quite sure if that's happened yet, um, but uh, definitely definitely an important aspect of, of their study. That's a good point. Okay. Just one other question over here. Yeah. So the nickel, the nickel on the microwires on top of the protection layer was actually um, deposited with sputtering, uh, which is relatively conformal, but not as conformal as ALD. That's right. Yeah. So nickel could be deposited ALD. I think that the student doing the work was maybe just not patient enough to figure that out. So. Okay, so uh, let's thank Matt once again. Thank you.